I'm going to talk about flavor and uh, appetite for flavor. So a few months ago, I was uh, in the kitchen. It was a dinner service. We just finished it, and we were talking about uh, creativity. And it went on an hour or two. And by the end of the session, one of the chefs comes up to me and says, Chef, I'm not, I'm not sure I get it. How is it that I'm going to be uh, creative? And of course, I had to laugh because I still don't know that completely. I actually learned a lot today about it. Uh, but I told him that um, we, 12 years ago, we had one navigation point, which was shed off all preconceptions about flavor, which was, has been very, very important for us. So having done that, it changed our, pre, our idea of what flavor is fundamentally. Our outlook changed. We've grown to understand ways in which flavor has never been used, ways that it can actually be used as a driver for change, even social change. So I'm going to start by taking you back to one of the worst winters in Copenhagen, something we have quite a bit of, unfortunately. It was in the beginning years of Noma, and we were in trouble, because back then we didn't know what we know today about how to stock up during the growing months. Today, we have thousands of kilos of food that we're already putting in, in our larder for the cold winter. But back then, we didn't. And we had, I believe, 48 days of straight frost, day and night. Some days, minus 30 at night. Some days, minus 10. Nothing grows. Literally, everything stands still. And there we were with our promise to cook the best the seasons have to offer, to distill a moment in time onto a plate. So. In the midst of this gloom, I had called up one of my chefs or one of my friends, a farmer called Sam Viof, and I told him, bring everything you have, and he brought a pile of carrots. And they were old carrots. He told me beforehand, these carrots are old, and I've had them in my storage room for a long time. And I was looking at them, and they were old and gnarly, and I could actually bend them into a circle. <laughs> but when you're there, and guests are coming at night, you think to yourself, okay, so here's a carrot. We're put off by all how old it is, but that's because we're told or learned that fresh is best. What actually happens to a carrot when it's a year or two old? The chef gave it to me because he liked the flavor. There was something in it that he liked. You weren't just going to peel it. I have three daughters. I weren't just going to peel it and give it to my daughters to eat. Then they wouldn't like it. But what can come out of this vegetable if I change my mindset? So that's what I tried doing. I told myself, this isn't a root vegetable. This isn't a root vegetable. I tried to convince myself a few times. I said, value it as a slab of meat, a very expensive cote de boeuf that you paid 50 pounds for. And of course, that changed everything for how you cooked it. Suddenly, it wasn't just gemüse. It was a valued, precious thing that I had to get something out of because I don't want to throw money away. So I cooked it. And I twist, and I turned, and I cooked it, and I added butter, and I twist, and I turned, and I cooked it like the best chef would do, would do a premium cut from a good restaurant. And after an hour or so, maybe an hour, 30 minutes, this, this carrot transformed. The skin was now crunchy, but also leathery and fruity, like a blueberry. The flesh inside had condensed and reached a point of tenderness and pulpiness that I'd never seen before. It was fragrant, and it had an intensity and lushness to it that I'd never, ever seen in a carrot. It was meaty. So that carrot not only changed our perspective on edibility as it did deliciousness. How many of us would have just overlooked it or simply thrown it in the bin? 600 billions of tons of fruit and vegetable hit the trash before it hits our plate, and that's only in Europe. Oftentimes, they don't even make it off the farm, not because of quality or taste, but because of aesthetical reasons. Broadly speaking, we as consumers are too bent over misshapen apples, and we're deadly scared of expiration dates. I won't even get into touching raw meat or raw fish. So for a while, with all these new epiphanies and all this thinking, we thought, let's provide a stage somewhere where we can you know, talk about the vintage carrot and what it can potentially lead into. 
We let the idea saturate, and over a few years, it gave the birth to something that we call MAD. M-A-D. MAD actually means food in Danish. And it is an organization that's designed to keep, keep up with this rapidly changing trade, which is the food trade in general, to provide a meeting place for ideas and to make food better for everyone. So at the first MAD, it took the form of a symposium. We wanted first to, to provide a place where the people in our industry could, could meet and share their breakthroughs. So, you know, the ones that keep your eyes and vision sharp and clear. S recently, MAD has been taking action, focusing on projects that can bring about change through technologies and information accessibility. Over the years, we've seen the birth of a, quite a few number of ideas, actually. One of my favorites was born again out of a shitty uh, uh, day uh, during the end of winter. But now this uh, idea has started to reach its potential, not just on the menu of Noma. And when I say it was a shitty day, it was truly a shitty day. And actually, it was even shittier than that because I was on a, on a, on a Scandinavian beach. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a Scandinavian beach. There should be invented a new word for Scandinavian beach. It is just awful. There is rottening seaweed carpeting uh, uh, the, the whole uh, sand. And I was there in my boots, walking around, trying to see some new growth so we could kickstart the year. For us cooks, the year is not New Year's evening. The, the, the new year is when the first green shoot starts coming. That's when we start planning and life again starts. So I was looking for green shoots, and I was walking through uh, with my rubber boots in this rottening seaweed with biting flies all around. And I remember the sound of, of, a, of, a, of a, like a toilet plunger sound when, when my boots were sinking into this rottening seaweed. And I saw this uh, patch of green. I went towards it, and um, somehow this looked good. It looked good. And I snapped it. It, was, it looked like chives. I snapped it and, it, and it had a crisp, like when you break an asparagus or when you cut into a watermelon. And that fueled me with confidence to think this is edible. This is something I usually don't do. And I wouldn't encourage all of you amateur foragers to go out and start eating things you don't know what is, unless you have an affinity to instant diarrhea or something like that, <laughs> which is something everybody at Noma has tried at least once in their career. But I ate it, and I was chewing, and at first it was just salinity from the beach. And then the flavor hit me. It was actually coriander. So I stood there for minutes, completely flabbergasted. Could it really be this flavor that I've, that I've you know, traveled to, to Thailand for? Or I had in Mexico City over tacos, that it, that it had been here all along, disguised as beach grass? coming through rottening uh, seaweed. I mean, we're in good old Protestant, spiceless Denmark. We, can't have, we, we don't have things like that taste as good as coriander, I thought to myself. On the way back, I was anxious as a child to share this discovery because I also felt a new sense of urgency that I hadn't had before. I just wanted to know more. What other gems was there? From that day on, the world really looked different for us. Instead of a beach, a shitty beach, or just a forest, suddenly it was pantries and larders we could see. The world was edible. I had a new appetite. The taste of that leaf 11 years ago has now grown into a program that we call Wild Food, Vilmel in Danish. Wild's food ambition is to map out the edible landscape, starting with Denmark, to encourage people to navigate and explore it from school kids to the chef at the kitchen counter. We want everybody to be taught about seasonality, how to eat from the landscape, and of course, also how to take care of it, very importantly. We actually recently got funding to start this project, and we are excited to see how flavor, taste, can form a pact with the nat natural world. In Denmark, this is already happening. Twelve years ago, when we opened, we put on a little plant. It's called Ramp. In short, it's Ramp. In English, you call it Ramsons. You may have smelled it in early spring. It smells like garlic. It looks like a tulip leaf. And we put that on the menu. 
12 years ago. And to locals, it was like having zebra meat on the menu. It was that exotic, even though it was just found around. Today, it's on pizzas in Copenhagen. It's, on soup, it's in supermarkets in its season. Some of the 60 varieties of strange berries that you never hear about are now in yogurts all throughout the supermarkets. There's a real change happening. So in Copenhagen, we already began the process of information diffusion, but there's still so much to do here. Imagine that children, as part of their schooling, are taught about what, what's edible and not. That they are brought up understanding that trees are not only paper flooring or a new patio, but also actually something that can nourish you. Now imagine if you are out for a hike, a jog in the park, or a walk downstream, that you could snap a photo of something and then instantly access its potential for nutrition and deliciousness. This is what inspires us, and this is where we believe can have a huge impact in how people engage with nature once they start eating it. And just so you know, we, don't, we haven't stopped at just simple plants or berry. That will sway anybody in the end. No, for some time we've been working on a project that we called Deliciousness as an Argument for Entomophagy. So entomophagy is eating insects. And the project started uh, at the first MAD Symposium we held. It, was a, it was, came from uh, an idea from a chef called Alex Atala. He's Brazilian, and he's a, this big bearded ginger guy. And he came up on stage, literally, and just said, my name is Alex Atala, why don't you eat insects? And at first I said, because they're disgusting. <laughs> But then, of course, I thought a, little, uh, I thought a bit about it to so say, shut off those preconceptions that you have about what's food and think about it. And I thought, well, you know, I do eat honey. That's the vomit of a bee. So why don't I just eat other insects too, I thought to myself. He passed around little jellies, and there was a huge Amazonian ant in it. And I chewed, and it tasted like ginger and lemongrass, an explosion of flavor. And that's the moment where I was convinced, yeah, bugs, why not? So that was one little seed, a new inspiration, and a new layer to our work. Since then, we've taken so much ridicule in the gourmet world because, come on, you're replacing foie gras with crickets? Ha! You know, it's like it was the running joke for three, four years. But we found a way to transform these creatures from a different dimension into umami-rich bee larvae broths. Spicy ant pastes. We fermented a mix of moldy barley, grasshoppers, and wax moth larvae into a beautiful condiment that actually tastes like a mix between Mexican mole and aged soy sauce. We believe this range of ingredients have so much potential that we have no idea. I don't need to tell people here what a great ecological benefit it would be if we could replace 10% of meat consumption with a more sustainable protein, let's say insects. Of course, the nemesis here, again, is fixed preconceptions. It's not the easiest leap to make. But let's envision a scene, though, where in the future there's a table set, and there's two plates, option A, option B, and a couple sits down. And option one is the fattest, juiciest steak you can imagine. It's tender beyond belief, and the juices just burst into your mouth as you eat it. Option two is steamed rice and lots of crickets. Dozens of dead eyes are staring at you. <laughs> Which one will we choose? We believe that we will choose the one that's the most delicious. And we want to show at MAD that we can make the outcome of this scenario less predictable. We can absolutely make insects as delicious as steak, if not more. A lot of these ideas, they begin at the restaurant. That's the powerhouse, because that's where we work with taste and flavor day in and day out. But the best of the ideas where we feel there's big potential for change, we push them over to MAD. Because MAD holds the real future, we believe, the real possibilities. Nowadays, you see it all over in our shifting trade, cooks, they are actually trying to use their knowledge like that, not just for the sake of the 40 people at, at night. They want to take care of the guests long, before the, long after the bill has been paid. And they also want to do things that uses their skill set for the benefit of society, like all you successful engineers. 
So today what we see is a whole new world of opportunity for flavor. And that's what I wanted to say. That I hope that you can join us, especially in these parts of the world, in these good old Protestants world, where flavor equals uh, good times, and good times is not good. <laughs> that you can, that you can jo join us in a new appetite for flavor. And then I think we can create real sustainable change in the food world. Thank you very much.